I think the thing that I learned quite early is what I was good at and what I enjoyed. And I think that's probably the thing that I'd say that to start with. So just be really clear on the stuff that you really like. Um, because for me, the two things that I absolutely 100% hang my hat on are like my problem solver and I'm a relationship builder. Because I think people get in lanes and they feel like they need to stay in their lane. So, you know, I work in HR. Do I need to stay in HR forever? No. Will I? Possibly. I don't know. But I've only been in that for the last kind of 13, 14 years. But the stuff that I've learned over the years is transferable from one role to another. It's not just that, you know, those are not the only two things I'm good at. But I know that they're the two things that I get my energy from. And I think helping to understand that and go, right, okay, I get really, really enthusiastic when something's broken and I can help to fix it. I'm Louise Powell. I work for Specsavers and I'm the head of HR. I've been with Specsavers for about three and a half years now. My job is exciting and different every day. I think that's probably how I'd describe it. So the stuff that I look after... So obviously I look after the what you would generally see as HR stuff, which is the things when stuff perhaps isn't going right or whether it's relationships that need help with supporting or fixing, but also get the great opportunity to, to talk about people's development, their career choices, all that sort of really exciting stuff. So I think as a head of HR, every day is literally different. Get to work with the board right the way through to kind of people on their first day to apprentices, so everybody across the organisation, which is really exciting. Specsavers is still a privately owned business, which I think a lot of people don't know. So the, the founders of the organisation, I think almost 40 years ago now, Doug and Mary, set up the business because actually they recognised that not everybody was getting the access to healthcare. But when I was kind of at school, people went to the opticians and if they had to have glasses, they were NHS glasses and they were kind of that thick, you know, at one shape. Everybody had the same glasses. There was no fashion. There was, there was kind of no excitement really in getting a pair of glasses. But actually that's all changed and Specsavers have been really at the heart of that through Doug and Mary. So they wanted everybody to have access to kind of fashionable and affordable specs, which is really great. And with that, since then has come audiology, has come visiting people in their homes when they can't come to us anymore. Um, so there's so much about spec savers. But I think you touched on it. The exciting thing for me is how Doug and Mary set up that business. So they needed people, optometrists, obviously, but also retailers to come in and run their businesses for them. And at the heart of our organisation is something called partnership. So people go, um, people buy into our businesses and run their own local businesses. So they're really at the heart of the community. So if you work in a spec saver store, the person who owns that business is, you know, in that store with you all the time, is making the decisions. It's it's a much kind of makes for a much more kind of open and inclusive environment because you've got the leader in your room. So, yeah, it's quite an exciting business because of that. Actually, it's, it's what a colleague of mine that you met the other day calls the secret sauce, which I think is probably a good way of describing it. I had a, a wonderful childhood, actually, but we, we, we weren't wealthy by any stretch. So both parents worked. I think they refer to it as the latchkey generation, don't they? So you kind of come back to school, everybody's at work. We kind of lived in, you know, a council estate in local authority housing. We had a kind of wonderful upbringing, a lovely community. But I didn't have the luxury of a lot of things that I guess many people would. So, I, you know, we, I think I was probably about 19 when I went on my first foreign holiday when I started working myself. That wasn't part of our kind of upbringing, which is, again, fine, but just wasn't part of what we did back then financially. I think mum and dad, you know, from their background, nobody had ever gone to university. Education wasn't really at the heart. Everything was really about getting a job, right? You know, from the second you leave school, you need to get yourself a job. You need to earn yourself a wage. You need to kind of get out from under our skin and start your own life and start your own family. And I, you know, my family are from Norfolk. I, I grew up most of my life in Bedfordshire, but actually in Norfolk, again, there's, there's a real kind of strength of kind of starting a family of, of that kind of being a wife, being a female, if I'm 100% honest, it was culturally back then kind of that was one of the things that you just went off to do. So I guess that's kind of what my upbringing looked like. And like I say, university just literally wasn't on the radar for me. It was all about getting a job. And I did start my A-levels, actually. Interestingly, I don't know what I said. I didn't know what I wanted to do and what my ambitions were. But I started, I, I was doing an archaeology A-level. I don't know where I thought that was going to take me, but it was really exciting at the time. But um and then also doing some retakes because, like I say, education wasn't really at the kind of heart of what my family focused on. And so English and maths was important moving forward. And so I was doing retakes of my GCSEs because that didn't go over really well first time round. And when I finished the GCSE retakes, I've got a, a reason. I think I was kind of I, I just stretched into the grade C, I think, on both of those maths and English. I just got myself over the line. I realised that actually the A-level, the archaeology A-level, and I, I think I was also doing 
PE or something, which again is equally great if you're going into that sort of career, but I kind of didn't know what I wanted to do. So I decided to move back to Bedfordshire where my dad was living because my parents had split up at that point. Um, Mum and I were in Norfolk and dad was back in Bedfordshire. So I decided to move back to Bedfordshire to try and get a job because it offered different opportunities to Norfolk. And I did just that. And actually back then it was, it wasn't an apprenticeship. It was a youth training scheme. That was a, they used to call it a YTS. And I went to work for a company called Electrolux. And, you know, like I said, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it was just about opportunities. And I had two opportunities for, for YTSs, one with Whitbread, who are based in Luton, and one with Electrolux, who traditionally were based in Luton. So and there was a certain sense of pride for my dad, actually, because if you worked in Luton, you worked in either Vauxhall, Electrolux or Whitbread, right? They were the three big head offices that were around there. And I had two opportunities on the table. One paid £35 a week, believe it or not. That was how much he got paid back then for a YTS. And one paid £50 a week. And so I went for the one that was £50 a week. So that's when I started my career at Electrolux. I guess to start with in my early career, just to, to kind of be really clear, I thought I was chasing a dollar. So I think, I think you know, that even just from that 35 quid to 50 quid, you know, that it was like I went with a 50 quid, even though actually the 35 pound one probably on paper was a better job. So I was kind of chasing the dollar a little bit, which I think is all right. OK, because you're then learning and understanding a bit about what you like to do. And when I was at Electrolux, I was doing data inputting. So I was kind of a, a speed demon typist anyway. I learned to type on a typewriter, by the way, Charlie, which makes me extremely old. Um, but but a speed demon typist, I kind of learned those skills at Electrolux. I think back in the, and I remember my mum saying to me, oh, brilliant. Once you learn how to type, that's kind of, you know, that's awesome. You can kind of continue and take that into any job. And I left Electrolux. I, I did. I, I went into a, a role with them after the YTS actually, and did an amazing role, which I helped think helped build my confidence, which was around working with different people from different backgrounds. I was I was basically taking calls from customers whose washing machines had broken down, and then sending out service engineers to fix them. And so it's both sides of that. So again, I got quite good organisation skills from that. I think that's a really important thing to remember, which we'll talk about a bit more in a bit. But it's the transferable skills you pick up from everything you take on. And when I chose to leave Electrolux, again, I was chasing the dollar a bit, actually. So there was a role for um, a call centre for HSBC. They were Midland Bank then, and then it moved straight into HSBC at the time. And it, it was well paid because actually it was quite a boring job. So you go, OK, I'm going to sit there all day, take calls, pretty much the same one. Can you tell me what my balance is? Online banking didn't really exist then. People just wanted to know how much money they got, that sort of stuff. So it was quite boring, actually, but, but the dollar was there. But I actually then... That brought with it some opportunities. And I I went to work in one of their branches, actually, cashiering for a bit, then went on to the, I was a debt counsellor, kind of out on the front desk, talking to people about their money. And so, again, that brought with it a load of experience. And and because I did have that level of confidence, I've I've always been a really good relationship builder. I think it probably comes through when when I spoke about my schooling history as well. Always got on with people. And that served me really well over the years. And so those kind of relationships with customers got me great feedback. Those relationships with the, the, the kind of people who were making decisions behind the scenes got me great feedback. And so I was offered a fast track management scheme. And I remember the day that I was offered it and I went home and told my parents, my God, they were so proud because, right, this is 18 months and you're an assistant or a bank manager. And I kind of went home and told them and I was like, yeah, underneath, I just wasn't pleased about it. And the reason I wasn't pleased is because back then a bank manager sat behind a big desk pretty much kind of ruined people's dreams by telling them they couldn't have loans. Didn't really come out and interact with all the people on the shop floor. You know, it was a very different role back then. I'm sure it's different now. But I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to be that person. I don't see that being me. And so when I told my parents probably a few days later that I actually wasn't going to accept the fast track management system. And to be fair, I've handed my notice in because I found another job. That went down well. And they were like, I don't know what you're doing. This is such a secure job. It almost kind of, I guess, felt to them like it was the opportunity for me to outperform them, I guess, who who both done really well in their retail careers. But it was an opportunity for me to be a bit of a pillar of the community in their minds. But I did turn that down, actually, which I, I guess probably could be seen as being quite brave. I think the thing that I learned quite early is what I was good at and what I enjoyed. And I think that's probably the thing that I'd say that to start with. So just be really clear on the stuff that you really like. Um, because for me, the two things that I absolutely 100% hang my hat on are like my problem solver and I'm a relationship builder. Because I think people get in lanes and they feel like they need to stay in their lane. So, you know, I work in HR. Do I need to stay in HR forever? No. Will I? Possibly. I don't know. But I've only been in that for the last kind of 13, 14 years. But the stuff that I've learned over the years is transferable from one role to another. 
it's not just that, you know, those are not the only two things I'm good at, but I know that they're the two things that I get my energy from. And I think helping to understand that and go, right, okay, I get really, really enthusiastic when something's broken and I can help to fix it. That's what really drives it. So if somebody comes to me and says, there's a role, there's a load of stuff that needs fixing, I'm I'm on board right really quickly. So I think, you know, my my advice on the back of that is understand what you get a buzz from because and I can't remember who says this so we'll we'll give it to me we'll quote it to Louise Powell 2023 but you know if you if you do something you love you never work a day in your life you know and I do feel like actually for the last 13 14 years when I've been helping people to develop and doing all that sort of stuff that's how it's felt it's like someone pays me for this yeah I'm kind of amazed by it so I guess the whole you know you won't find something you love quickly I've done some really really rubbish jobs over time actually but I learned from them I learned what I did and I didn't like and I think that's okay I guess it's it's about also not limiting yourself with things so you know you're right expectations of everybody around me was that I'd go off and do that bank manager job and that I'd probably have been really successful in it but would I have been happy no the other piece of advice is don't wait for people to come to you so when I was working so after HSBC I went and worked for a rental organization called Panther it was quite a small business I'm still friends with everybody from there now and you know it was a great organization and I was you know that their XMD now still tells me you were the best kind of what was a higher desk controller or salesperson that we've kind of ever had because of that because I had that kind of I guess comfort they knew that I was really good at my job I thought I'm not going to wait for you to come to me I know that I want to do something different so I went and said to them if you think I'm the best you've ever had why don't I train people you come to be as good as me who come on to be as good as me so took that idea and that thought process to them they went well do you know what we haven't got anyone training new starters actually go for it and they gave me a company car and sent me off on the road and I was training people and that was my first you know, my first kind of move into HR, it was into training. And I still now call myself a trainer by trade. And in HR, you're often around other people who have come through a very educated route, who have kind of come through university. And so often, you know, the third piece of advice is just don't listen to your inner voice. (laughs) Because if I listen to my inner voice every day, and, and, you know, we've spoken about me perhaps being quite confident, but if I listen to my inner voice every day, I'd be a disastrous mess because it tells me that I'm not good enough right around that table all the time because I don't come through that academic route but what I kind of always have to tell myself in response is that but you bring other things with you you bring experience you bring the you know the I guess the kind of commercial element you know I've run businesses before I've run P&Ls before through some of my past careers so I've had that experience and I think you're telling yourself that the things that you're you've got experience in are just as valuable because if we had everybody around the table who had only come through that academic route you're not going to have a rounded and and diverse view of the world are you it's not you know every everybody around you has to be different to get to get to good decisions good sound decisions 